The Lord be with you. I'm sorry, I know we're starting late, 25 minutes late. I'll make up as much as I can. Um, uh, you know, we had the issue over in the fellowship hall, so we'll, we'll pray for her. I think, uh, I think things will be all right, but uh, she's going to the right place to get checked out. Um, before we go into chapter four, I just want to touch a little bit on chapter three for five minutes. Um, I, I struggled, I think, a little bit in defining it clearly for you about this idea of theodicy. I talked about it in the sermon today, you know, um, that I would, I, I would talk about it, um, hopefully make it a little bit more clear. I, I actually went back and watched a video of my professor um, who had talked on this subject briefly during like an introduction. Inter actually, the course I watched was a uh, pre-seminary course, you know, for guys like me who weren't smart enough to pass the entrance exams, you had to go take a course, uh, an intensive course, to bring you up to the level of knowledge that I should have been at when I was confirmed. <laughs> um, it, either here, neither, neither here nor there. So um, before we get going, though, if it's all right, I'll, uh, let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are bound to praise you this day for the resurrection of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ whom you raised from the dead on that first Easter Sunday, who every day of our lives comes to us and renews us and refreshes us and makes us a new creature to rise from the sins of our, of our past so that uh, we can rise to you and on that last day become the creatures which you fully meant us to be uh, in your presence for eternity. Uh, during this, uh, this teaching time, Lord, I uh, ask that your spirit would come into each and every one of our hearts and, and allow us to, to comprehend and cling to and hold the very truths that point us to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is a review because this slide you saw last week, right? Theodicy. It's just a big church word, right, we use. But theodicy is the question really that gets to the, the point of why is it that bad things or evil things happen. Why does God allow suffering? Well, according to chapter 4, he doesn't allow it. He suffered, so he understands it. Correct. So, so, so he suffered, uh, so we can maybe comprehend or understand a little better. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that, you know, in the next section. That's true. So theodicy, though, is the question really not, this isn't a Lutheran idea, by the way, I mean, this is a Christian concept, but it comes down to the theological and philosophers will do this as well that aren't Christian. And that's why, you know, why does, why does it appear from a Christian Lutheran standpoint, you say, why does it appear that God allows suffering? Why does it appear that God allows evil? And, and how do you reconcile the fact that you have a God who is loving and all powerful, but yet at the same time allows evil to exist? We can admit there is evil, right? And so, from a Lutheran Christian standpoint, who is the author of evil? Satan. Satan. What brought evil into the world, into the creation? You could say Satan, but what event did Satan orchestrate that brought evil upon the creation? The snake. What's that? The snake. the snake in Genesis 3, right? The fall. It is the fall that brings evil into creation. And so, and it's not Eve. Remember, I've said this before. I mean, Eve, as it, Paul, Paul will write in 1 Timothy, was deceived. Because if you read Genesis 3 very carefully, it says, you know, Satan twists God's command not to eat of the knowledge of the tree of, or the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? He says, um, did God really say, and he slightly twists God's words. And so Paul affirms the fact that she was deceived. The, the difference is, was Adam deceived? No. Eve brings the fruit to Adam. Adam knows it's wrong, and what does he do? He eats of it anyways. And because Adam's given stewardship of creation, he falls, creation falls with it. So it's the whole creation that falls. That is where evil comes from. Now, to maybe flesh this out a little bit in a more practical way. And I you will admit I stole this from my professor. Um, I think he'd be okay with that. I don't know if the professor said you can't use my stuff, right? But, you know, these are ideas that he had. I mean, the, in this pretty much why 
why did this evil, why, why does the evil thing, when I write this thing, why did this evil thing, I mean like generically to your life. Why do people die? Why do people get hurt, mangled up, you know, the emotional traumas that we suffer in our life? Why do these bad things happen? Because we're Christians. These bad things shouldn't happen to Christians, right? I mean, that's it's kind of a, a cultural idea, though, isn't it? So how do we reconcile the fact that God is good? And if we were in a Pentecostal church, we'd, you guys would say at the end of that, what? All the time. You never heard that? God is good and the congregation responds all the time? Oh, come on. Are you guys all cradle Lutherans? Okay, that would be why. And God is all powerful. He's omnipotent, right? He's all knowing, all powerful. So if God is good, God is all powerful, I could even add another bullet point under there. He's transcendent. Remember last week, God is outside of the creation. God is not in the creation. He doesn't have to play by our rules because he created the rules. And, you know, I, I, I'm a pilot, right? You know, the funny thing about administrative law when you deal like with aviation, where Congress tells uh, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, that you can create regulations, right, to regulate aviation. Well, if they create them, guess what they can do? They can waive them and change them, and they do. Um, that's kind of like God in a sense, right? I'm using a practical example, but God creates the laws which creation have to abide by, but that doesn't mean that he's bound by them, is he? So God is outside of creation. That's how in our gospel lesson in John chapter 20 it can say that even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Remember, I mean, I touched on that last week, or two weeks ago, right? Um, it's because God, Jesus being God, can do things with his body that you and I can't do. So this is the idea that he's, he's transcendent above it all. So then, it, so then it's, the, it's the part of how do we reconcile that evil exists if God is all these things? Because think about it this way. If God is all-powerful, God is good, God is transcendent, God is love, all of these positive attributes of God, which are very true, then how do we reconcile the fact that God allows evil to exist? Maybe that's a question in there for you. Does God allow evil to exist? Who, who thinks God allows evil to exist? Now, I'm not pointing on anybody, you know, you know, that's not my, my game, right? Um, if you didn't raise your hand, you're actually engaged in theodicy and you don't know it. Because you want, you don't, you want to make a defense or an apology for God, in a sense. I mean, that's our natural inclination, right? So if you say, well, God doesn't allow it to exist, then what you've just done is you have, you've tried to give an answer right? Without giving an answer because no, God could never do it because God is good and God is all powerful. So how could he allow that to happen? And when we do that, well-meaning, and this was the example I gave last two weeks ago when we talked about like in the hospital, people trying to give reasons why God allowed something or didn't allow something to happen. Maybe God didn't have the ability to do something like, you know, heal somebody. Well, if God didn't heal somebody, then he's not all powerful, is he? You know, I have actually seen that happen with chaplains before, or I've heard stories at least, where, and I've seen it personally once, where, you know, they, they're, they're in a sense trying to get God, remember last week I said, off the hook for the evil? And so what do you do? You go to, well, you know, God wanted to do it because he's good, he just couldn't. Well, if you did that, what have you just taken away? You've, you've taken away his transcendence. What you've done is you've taken him from outside of creation and put him squarely in it and forced it to force them to play by the rules of it. But the, God doesn't do that. He transcends creation. See, the problem is every time we try to answer a question of this, we are going to do one of several things. We're going to take away the fact that God is good because there are Christians who say, well, in, in the history of the church, that maybe God is the author of evil too. Is God the author of evil? No. From a Lutheran Christian standpoint, God is not the author of evil. He's good, and he's good all the time, and he can't be anything other than that. So he can't be the author of evil. But we also have to come to terms with the fact that God allows it to, evil to exist. Because if he didn't allow evil to exist, then is he all-powerful? 
In other words, could God have stopped the evil in his creation? Easily. So that means he chose not to. You see what I'm saying with that? But we don't know why. We don't know his deliberative process, if he even has to have you know, a deliberative process. He's God. He's all-knowing. We don't know why he does it. We just have to trust that he does. So anytime we try to provide an answer of why evil exists, you are taking away from either the fact that God is good all the time or God is all-powerful. But you're going to diminish God in order to answer that question. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, he did. Okay, so God created his angels. He had an archangel. Correct. Lucifer was an archangel. Yes. And if God knew what was going to happen, why did he choose it? So, that's a very good question. And so the question, in case it wasn't picked up on the video for those watching, is... God created angels. Yes, he did. When did he create angels? We don't know. The scriptures don't say, but they were created sometime. And were, could they have been created before the creation? It's possible. We just don't know when. We just know that angels pre-existed, right? Um, uh, the humans, when God created them on the, what day was that? I'm having a brain lapse. But it doesn't matter, right? It's not the first day or the second or the third. I think it's fourth, whatever. Um, and he created archangels, and Lucifer was an archangel. He was actually the highest rank of angel, and he rebelled against God. And you know, you get Jesus talking about, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. God kicked him out, right, because of the rebellion. And there was a significant number of angels that went with him who were part of the rebellion against God, and that is our demons. So demons, you know, another thing we'll call them is fallen angels. They are fallen angels. And, you know, it's also why we don't want to play with them, because they are spiritual beings, but they have powers that we don't have, right, as mortals. And so, um, you know, so, but the question is, well, why did God even create the angels if they were going to fall? Well, I mean, I could ask the same question, right? Why did God create humans if he knew they were going to fall? Did he know they were going to fall? He sure did. We don't ever want to answer that question. We can't answer that question. Because remember we talked about last two weeks ago, the deus absconditus, the, the, the um, obscure or the hidden God, right? Versus the revealed God, the deus revelatus, right? Jesus. When we try to ask questions about why did evil exist, why did God allow people to fall, why do bad things in general happen, we are trying to ask a question of the hidden God, which we cannot know. We can't approach him. We can't fathom the depths of what his, his, his decision-making process is. I say decision-making, I mean, again, I don't think he de deliberates, he just knows, right? But we can't get into the mind of God, and so we don't want to play there. Because when we play there, we are giving an answer we don't know, and it's going to either do one of these two things in order to try to get God off the hook of why bad things happen. So then the question then turns, and we'll move on, is how do we answer? Well, here it is. We don't explain. We don't try to. I'll tell you one of the starkest things that happened to me in my ministry. I, I was in, on vicarage. I'd been ministering to a middle-aged woman, a nurse, who was dying of cancer. Spent a lot of time with her. And she was at home on hospice, you know, which happens in churches often as things come in threes, it seems like bad things, right? They hit you all at once. And uh, there was another member of the church who... Uh, elderly member who was uh, kind of a cornerstone of the church. They were having the meeting that morning with the family to tell him, hey, it's time, you got to go into an assisted nursing facility. And, uh, and so the pastor, my supervisor, was dealing with him. Well, we get a call that the lady who I've been ministering to has just been taken to a hospice house because she can't breathe. Of course, she's on hospice, but she's been taken to a hospice house in an ambulance. And so I'm like, hmm, I probably need to go but I don't want to usurp my supervisor, right? So I'm trying to call him. Well, he's not answering because he's with this meeting. And I, after about 45 minutes, I'm like, you know what? I just got to make a decision and go. So I do. And as I'm driving over there, I'm thinking in my head, you know, I'm a vicar. I haven't really dealt with this a lot. I actually hadn't dealt with it at all at that point. What am I going to say? What's going to happen? I walk in wearing just a polo shirt, you know, not this. And this is South Carolina. They don't know Lutherans in South Carolina, right? 
They know Baptists and Pentecostals, but they don't know Lutherans and they don't know Catholics. And so I walk down the long hallway, nobody at the nurse's station. I'm walking back, and there's a nurse in the nurse's station. And she looks at me and she goes, uh, are you the vicar? And as soon as she said that, I'm like, oh, this isn't good. <laughs> and uh, she, said, uh, she said, here, follow me. And it's like three doors down. She's walking me to this door. And literally, she's opening the door, and she says, she just passed away a couple minutes ago, and her husband's in there. So, like, what do you say in four or five steps? And bam, you're with them. You know, there's no prep time. God is faithful, and he will give you the right answers. The thing you don't want to do in this situation, whether you're a pastor or whether it's you comforting a family member, a loved one, or a friend, or an acquaintance, is try to explain why that thing just happened. Because if you do, you are going to start playing and taking away and diminishing from one of these two things with God. You don't offer an explanation because you don't know. So what do you do? You sit with them in their suffering. You acknowledge it sucks. That's what you do. You mourn with them. You know, we see this in John's gospel with Lazarus being raised from the dead. And some of the translations say, that I, I believe I'm saying this right, there's a mourning party. Not mourning as in mourning, but M-O-U-R-I-N-G. Mourning party. That they would literally have people that would go to mourn with them. The, the solidarity that, you know, this idea that Paul develops that, and Luther develops as well. I'll use Luther's example. Paul talks about the body of Christ. Luther says, hey, you know, if you're walking around and you're, you stub your toe, does not the whole body, uh, you know, become, you know, the pain resonate? He uses a different term. I think it's, I don't remember exactly. But doesn't the whole body hurt because of a toe? And the idea is that as a body of Christ, if one of us hurts, we all hurt on a various level, right? The traumas that we experience as a pastor, you know, like uh, if it's a, your spouse or your child that dies, that's a huge trauma for that person, right? A lifelong trauma that's going to happen the rest of their life. For a pastor, or if you're like on a team that goes and ministers to people like that, it's not a major trauma, but it's a minor trauma in your life. And those minor traumas add up over time to become something big if you don't, you know, find an outlet and take care of yourself. You don't explain you acknowledge that the evil exists and that the evil had its way. And you sit there, and I would say from a pastoral standpoint, you suffer alongside them. I kind of already talked about the acknowledgement of the evil. That goes hand in hand. But you also tell them what you do know. And what is it that you do know? That even though this evil befell somebody, that God is still God. And if God is still God, he is still good and he is still all powerful. And what we also know is that even though that evil exists in that person's life, and especially when we're talking about death, is that death will not have the final word. There's still plenty of sting in death this side of eternity. That sting will be fully removed in the resurrection, right? Because we will all be alive in Christ again. But we know that death has been swallowed up in the death of Christ. That because of Christ, the victory has already been won for us. It happened over 2,000 years ago. Well, not quite close. So this is how you deal with evil. And th this is the Christian response to it. Does that make sense? I talk way more than five minutes. So, moralistic, th oh, now, moving into the, the chapter for today. Any questions about, I'm going to refer to moralistic therapeutic deism as MTD. That's what we did at seminary, it's a mouthful, it's just MTD. Because that, that's kind of what was throughout the entire chapter, right? So we'll, we'll hit this one. Any questions? Anything you didn't understand? Did it make sense? I know sometimes I've heard, you know, certain people, you know, I've heard people throughout the years tell me that, you know, sometimes it's hard to follow the thought process. And if it was, hopefully we'll flesh this out. And if you, as you have questions, please ask, okay? So what I'm doing here, let's contrast Lutheranism from ther uh, moralistic th or moral therapeutic deism, MTD. Uh, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, has kind of come around. There's five points to this. 
um, I, and it was written in a, a book. I don't remember. The footnote is in the uh, is in the book there. You know, I think on like the third or fourth page of the chapter says the person the the two people that wrote the book. And what they're doing is they're just in a sense from a Christian standpoint, sociologically looking at the landscape of the culture, not Christians, but the culture, and saying, well, you know, what, what is it the culture is like? What, what do they do predominantly? And this is the idea they came up with. And this all connects back into chapter one, right? We talked about moralism, right? Remember? Moralism is you try to approach God through being a good person, right? Through good acts, morally. Moral. So there's some, in, there's some part of morality that is in this. That is actually a good thing. That means our culture isn't completely off the rails, right? That they're not completely hedonistic like the animals, even though they're pretty close. So there is some moral element to it. It's not necessarily good, but at least it's there. It allows the Holy Spirit to reach down and do his thing. It's therapeutic. Self-help, right? It's huge in our culture today, right? You play around on YouTube enough, I mean, you're going to get about what? If you sit there for a half hour, you're probably going to see 15 different self-help ads, right? Do you guys get those, or is it just me? Maybe it's because I search for them. I don't know. I don't search for them per se, but, you know, I, I look at that stuff probably more than I should. So it's a therapeutic kind of moralism. And then deism. Deism kind of comes about in the Enlightenment period of the 18th century, I've talked about this briefly before, our founding fathers, not all of them, there was many devout Christians in that group, but there were certainly deists. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Their idea was that God, the creator God, not the Christian God, the creator God, kind of made creation up like the master Swiss watchmaker, perfect, balanced, and uh, set it off and walked away, and he is impersonal to the creation. He does not interact with creation. And so for Thomas Jefferson, Jesus was not God. Jesus was just a good moral teacher. And if you don't believe me, go look it up online or travel up to D.C. to the National Archives, I believe is where it's at, and look at his Bible. It's on display, or at least it used to be. I don't know if it still is. You'll find he took a straight edge and he cut out all the miracles of Jesus in his Bible. Cut them literally out of the page. Why? because he doesn't believe in miracles. What did he focus on? The parables and the teachings of Jesus. Principles, moral principles that he could live by to be a good person, not the miracles of Jesus. So, <clears throat> the view of God from, from an MTD standpoint, God is distant and impersonal, just like the deists of the 18th century, right? So there's a less... Emphasis on personal relationship with God and involvement in the world. God is not really concerned with the day-to-day -day goings on in your life or the world's, the life of the world. Does that make sense? Compare that with Lutheranism. Is God involved in your affairs? Intimately. He knows every single, he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows you better than you know yourself. Right? Does God care about what's going on in this world, the evil? He absolutely does. And we know that because of what? He sent his son to die on the cross, right? So we know God cares about what's going on. You know, another thing about, I just want to di uh, digress for a second. You know, a, a place to point Jesus to that I, I, I think is super powerful, you know, with people and who, and when they're suffering, right? You know, I said, you tell them the things you do know. What about the Christians who are persecuted? What about uh, all 10 of the remaining, or 11 of the remaining disciples at, in church history, you know, tradition, not necessarily scriptural except for Paul, uh, were martyred for their faith? They only, actually, it's 10. Because we know Judas committed suicide, and we know that John died an old man, but John didn't have a good life. I mean, he was in prison, right? And all these beatings and all these things, so it wasn't good for any of them, right? How is it that I can say that God is still good and that God cares and he's all powerful in the midst of suffering that it seems like he's bringing upon me? Apparently bringing upon me because we know that's not the case. And the answer is look what happens at the stoning of St. Stephen, right? Stephen, is it Stephen? I believe it was. I'm having a brain lapse, but the disciple who was they cast lots to replace uh, Judas. Um, was Stephen or Matthias? 
Now I got to look it up because I feel stupid now. But anyways, you get the point of what I'm saying, right? So he's stoned, right? And who stones him? Or who's responsible for the party that stones him? Paul. Paul. He was the organizer of the event that stoned the replacement disciple for, for Judas. And right before he dies... He looks up to heaven, and this is an axe, by the way. You can look it up and fact check me. And I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it exactly memorized, but he says something to the effect that he sees Jesus at the right hand of God. And what is Jesus doing? Do you, does anybody remember? He is standing. He is not taking this, the death of his saint that's about to happen, sitting down. He's standing. And if for, from a royal standpoint, King's stand is a call to action at the throne, right? And so God does not take the suffering lightly that we go through. He is with us, and he is standing. You know, he's actually, he's, you know, he's actually doing something about this. And we know that's going to come to fruition finally on the last day. So God is, is a very personal God for each and every one of us, and he interacts with us. He interacts with us through just, of course, the death of, of, of Christ, but he interacts with us today through what? The scriptures, the word. He interacts with us through the sacraments, through baptizing, which actually does something, right? First Peter, baptism now saves you. It actually does something. It's not, you know, me doing this. It's God doing it. Uh, through the Lord's Supper, we receive his body and his blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine. It's a special way of using our other senses to... Uh, to, to confirm the forgiveness of sins we have in Jesus. And he, we don't get booming voices from heaven, right? But in prayer, does the Spirit work with us? I mean, the Spirit knows what we're praying for before we pray, in a sense. That doesn't leave us off the hook for praying, by the way. But he, he knows how to intercede for us with groans that are too deep, right, to put words to. Another way is the authority of Scripture. If you have this moral field uh, or MTD, so what's it going to prioritize? You see some Christian denominations and traditions going this way more and more. And it's a constant battle even in Lutheranism because our, our sinful nature wants us to do what? Prioritize what? The word or prioritize personal experience? I mean, what's the world tell you to prioritize? Your personal experience, right? So we have to be reminded again and again and again, no, we have to prioritize what? Jesus. And Jesus is the Word. And the Word is the Scripture, right? So it's all the same thing. But we have to hold to the authority of Scripture and everything that we say and do and believe gets, gets built around what the Scripture tells us. By the way, you don't have to take pictures. I keep saying I'll send these PowerPoints out. I will send them out to you um, in the next week, I promise. Um, so, for Lutherans, it's all about the Scripture, right? It's our only source and norm of our faith, right? It's what tells us everything that we need to know. So, we, we hold it very closely. What about theological doctrines, right? So... An MTD person who kind of holds to this, which again is kind of emblematic of our, our culture as a whole. They don't really have a specific theological system, right? And so they loosely hold a set of beliefs. But what are those beliefs shaped by? Are they shaped by God's word? No. They're shaped by their preferences and the norms of society. There's a whole set of churches called the mainline Protestant denominations, right? Do they kind of, are they infected by this? You might want to call them the liberal Protestant churches, but, you know, they get mainline. That would be the ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church America. It would be the Presbyterian Church USA. It would be the Episcopal Church. Are they shaped more by Scripture today, or are they shaped more by the individual preferences of its members and the societal norms? And this is the problem, is that once you go that direction and you, un, uh, you disconnect yourself, in a sense, from Scripture, then something is going to affect you. And what is it that's going to norm what you do? Well, if it's not the Scripture, it's going to be the culture around you. 
And so as the culture changes, guess what you're going to do? Change with the culture. We're to the point now in Christianity, if you are a confessional Lutheran, you know, you believe the scriptures and hold to it, does that make you a weirdo in polite society today? It's called a spade a spade. It makes you an abnormality. You are not the majority in this country anymore. And you're quickly, quickly, quickly becoming a smaller and smaller fraction of the overall uh, society around you. So, but what's the difference? Well, for confessional Lutherans, we have a set of confessional documents that we abide by, or not abide, but documents that guide us as Christians, right? They, they give us an understanding of how to understand the scriptures. So it's kind of like a, a roadmap to the scriptures. Not that they tell us, they don't tell us what the scriptures tell us. They give us, uh, think of like a, I don't know, a boating analogy, a maritime analogy. You know, you have buoy markers, right? So the, the confessions serve as a, uh, a channel markers, right? The buoys that tell you if you stay in between these two, you, these two buoys, the red and the green, you're good, right? But if you go outside of them, you're outside the confessions and through experience and through centuries of historical Christianity, we know if you get outside of these boundaries, now you're in trouble, right? Just like a boat of running aground. Well, you're in trouble of making a shipwreck of your faith. So for Lutherans, the Lutheran confessions are, the, are, are giving us guidance on how to understand the scriptures so that we don't go a ground, run a ground. Does that make sense? No, of course it would die. Oh no. Well. Hmm. I charged that thing last night, I promise you. And uh, the problem is, don't have, could you get in that closet back there? There's a power cord, please. I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to make this work, but. Uh, well, that's disappointing. So I'm going to talk a little bit, because what I had was basically the summary of this while we're doing this. Hopefully it's just the, it's, it is the battery, I was going to say. Hopefully it's just the battery and not uh, something internally fail, failed. I'm um, over here. If you, will. you can unplug the one underneath of it. Okay, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So while I'm doing that, any questions so far? So guess what I'm going to have to hook up now next week? Yes. <laughs> so we don't have that happen again. Which one did? Oh, thank you. Oh, the best laid plans, right? How long will it take for the battery to get a couple percent? Is this resonating with you, by the way, when you think about what the culture is around us today versus what, what we believe, teach, and confess? Good. If that's not the case, then I failed you. Well, let me just give that another... Quick minute to, to uh, technology, right? Yep. I won't tell you about technology on airplanes, you never want to fly again. Engineers think they've got it all figured out, but you know the problem is this, the systems are so complicated and interrelated, and nowadays, unlike older planes or things, we're more 
and they are, the systems are separated and there's backup systems, so, so in theory one won't affect the other and you have double and triple redundancy on things. But because of the computer age, everything talks to everything computer-wise, just like you know they do in, in bigger, you know, in, in, in offices and everything else. So one error can enter the system somewhere and cause all kinds of chaos downstream that the engineers never conceived would happen. And that happens. And uh, you just sit up front like, okay. Here we go. What are we going to do now? <laughs> I won't tell you the, you can imagine the words they use. It's not what are we going to do now, but uh, it's more colorful. All right, so. Uh, almost there. And of course now it's uh, there we go. Now I got to talk even faster. All right, so we're there. All right, emphasis on sin and grace. Do you think that people with MTD um, really buy into this idea that we're sinful, corrupted, beyond, uh, beyond repair? No. It's this idea, you're okay, I'm okay, right? Um, and so their concept of sin focuses more on what? Everything is turned in on themselves, right? So the concept of sin focuses on what? Individual well-being, self-esteem, and, and personal fulfillment. Hence, all of your Facebook self-help ads. Because that's what it is, right? They're trying to fulfill a hole that they have inside themselves, and they think that they can overcome this idea of sin, and then they get grace twisted. Grace is when I overcome something, right? But no, that's not what we consider, right? Sin and grace. We can't escape sin. We're all corrupted by it. And we also can't receive grace on our own. We can't merit it. That's freely given by God. In a sense, like an MTD, uh, in our, our culture today, and MTD, by the way, the, you know, these, are, these are your younger generations, by the way. These are your uh, whiners. Let me say that. Whiners. Um, you know, the, uh, the participation trophy kids. Which generation is that? Uh, the millennials, right? Yeah. We can't beat up on them too bad because really, for some of you, it's your fault because you raised them. So um, th there is an interconnection that happens between generations, you know. I had one professor, one of the most pastoral professors in seminary, if not the most. And I just remember in class, Woodside, he was kind of railing about, uh, about uh, the, the, the younger generation, the millennials. And I, 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 I ha we had a good enough relationship where I was like, I won't tell you his name. I was like, so... Uh, I just said in class, kind of a smart aleck way, well, you know, it's your generation's fault, right? You guys raised them, so, you know, it takes some responsibility here. It's like, I told I said, it's the baby boomers that ruined it all. Um, but anyways, they see this personal fulfillment. And again, you see this when all this self-help stuff out here, that's what this is about. From a confessional Lutheran standpoint, right, we emphasize what? Well, the Christian doctrines, doctrine is good teaching. And what are the good teachings of? Of sin, original sin, right? The fact that we're all fallen. All, the things we talked about, I don't have to belabor it, right? So we look at it from a completely different standpoint than they do because we're looking at it from a God-centered standpoint. They're looking at it from a human standpoint. And that's going to come up in another slide here in a minute. Sin and grace, uh, what we, we touched on that already, right? You have salvation. Well, in MTDs, their work-oriented approach, right? Works-oriented, meaning how do they get to salvation? Through their efforts. Hence, again, I know I'm beating a dead horse, the self-help stuff. And I'm not saying self-help's not bad. I'm not saying that counseling is not bad and coaching and all these things that we have today. 
But for a Christian, it's got to be done in the understanding of the Christian experience, right? Of, of God's, you know, what God tells us through his scripture, not through, through the uh, human standpoint or our cultural idea today of the MTD of, um, you know, being that, you know, I'm somehow doing this, you know, I mean, you see this all the time. You will see the younger generation on various shows and they get interviewed. I mean, I've watched and some of these are controversial. They'll bring in promiscuous people on this one show they have on YouTube and they'll ask all kinds of questions and, and they, 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 they're doing all kinds of crazy things that you can imagine, right? And, uh, but you know what they say quite often about themselves? I'm a... You'll never hear that come out of my mouth about myself. I'm never going to say anything positive or negative about you, but when I assess myself because of God's law, which we talked about already, and it accuses us and condemns us, I will never say I'm a good person. Now, I, I'm not going to judge you if you do, but I'm not a good person. I know it because God's law tells me. I'm a, um, Jesus says, you know, when, when one of the Pharisees walks up to him in the scriptures and the gospels and says, good teacher, remember this passage? And what's Jesus' response? Who is good? That's Jesus saying that, right? Now, of course, Jesus is good all the time. But uh, he, he made his point. Uh, it looks like it's duplicating. No, it's not. Well, I duplicated a slide, so that's my fault. We know what Lutherans believe, so I messed that up when I copied it into here. Um, the Lutheran idea of salvation is it's outside of yourself. You can't do it, right? Oh, no. Come on. Hang with me here. Sacraments and worship. Well, they don't have a specific sacramental system, right? They don't have liturgical practices, you know, practices within the tradition of their faith. And so what do they do? They prioritize personal experience or individual expressions of their spirituality. I am not beating up on the big box churches, okay? I mean, there's, there's plenty to beat up on them about, but I, I, tried, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, dogging them. But, you know, in, in a Lutheran tradition, we have this worship wars go on in our church, right? Do we have a really straight contemporary service? Do we have a liturgical service, you know, where we're doing readings? You know, one tends to be more based off a tradition, right, liturgical. It's going through the history of the entire church. The people of Israel worship liturgically. That's not to say that it's like the best way to do it, but that is a community, a communal-based way of worshiping. But when you see the big box churches, you come, you sit down, and, you, you, and the really big ones with the production money, right? What do you end up watching? A worship, I mean, a, yeah, a concert, a Christian concert, right? And you get, you get a 45-minute lecture like you're in a college hall, and then you're sent on your way. That's a very individualistic thing. So you can see where th th this idea of the culture even influences us in the church. It influences us too. We're not above the fray. Of course, you know, the, 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 the traditions of the church is what anchors us to the word of God through the word and through the sacraments and the service, right? So that's why we don't want to just give it up. I, by the way, I'm all about innovation. I mean... We're going to be having discussions the next couple of months of what direction do we go in the worship services, right? And I can go either way, you know, as long as at the center of whatever way we worship, we end up with the word and the sacraments being key. As long as they're key, there's a lot of God-pleasing ways we can go, but we don't want to give that up. I mean, that's the core of our existence and our being as Christians. Make sense? Questions? I'm just going quickly because I know time. Uh, community and tradition, right? So, you know, the, the thing is, so their MTDs are going to be very autonomous, right? I have been in a big Lutheran church, had over 3,500 members. And, you know, you preach to a group of 700 people, and that's one of three services on Sunday. The other ones weren't quite 700. I mean, they are a couple hundred each. That's a lot of people. How can you as a pastor personally know that many people? We had five pastors on staff. We'll separate 3,500 people, divide it by five pastors. That's still a huge amount of people. You can't know them. It's just a sea of faces out there. And you see, but that's what people like today. That's why these big box churches thrive, because anonymity. They come in, and they sit down, and they don't know usually anybody around them. 
and they get up and they walk out. So they can be individualistic without the messiness of having to get to know people. And so, but that's what our culture does, right? I mean, that's a cultural thing. And so, you, you know, it again infects the church, even in our bigger churches. Versus, you know, from a Lutheran standpoint, where do we place our value? We don't do it very well. Even this is where the culture has infected the LCMS. I would say that I have, I've been, I've been in one church, eh, maybe two of the, I don't know how many I've been in now, that placed value on the role of Christian community and, and, and did a good job with the community aspect of it, relatively speaking. But it wasn't a perfect scenario, right? And uh, I think this is something that we need to really emphasize. You know, I mean, you've heard me say this before, right? This idea that when you come in, you know, it's not, I'm okay, you're okay. Um, let's put on the fake face and smile. It's when we have hardships going on in our life, we can open up with each other because this is what God has brought us together for, to strengthen each other's faith, right? As iron sharpens iron, right? Um, and, of course, the church traditions that we do. Now, wrapping this up here. To extranos or not, extranos, Latin, from outside of us, remember? So our faith comes from outside of us. Our salvation comes from outside of us. We don't create it. God does it, right? So extranos is an appeal or a way of saying God does these things. We don't. And so when we look at the contrast between the MTD, younger generations in our culture today, and the church, what do you see? The culture is very self-centered, isn't it? We are supposed to be God-centered, but we struggle with that, don't we? Because we're still sinful, we're going to struggle with that. It's a constant battle. And what we don't want is the cultural idea coming into the church. To put it in a, a term is we don't want to appropriate the culture into the church. Because, you know, if you're woke, you can't appropriate anyways, right? Um, but, the, but the bottom line is, we don't want to appropriate because it's bad. So we have to be on guard to keep it from creeping in. Make sense? Um, if, if you're not keeping up reading it, I, again, I'll, I'll send these out and you can look at them. What about works versus grace? We talked about that, right? So our culture is going to be based on what? Works. The church is based on grace. Grace. So um, the church, the right-hand kingdom of God, which has Jesus at the head, is the only place you receive God's grace. You don't receive it through the government or through the culture or through anything else in creation. You only receive God's grace through his church. That's by his design, right? So the church is where God's grace and forgiveness come from, through. And we talked about this already. Uh, uh, autonomy versus dependence. I mean, autonomy is what the, t what the people of our day do, right? I mean, it was in our founding documents, right? I mean, individualistic, you know, autonomy and individualism, same thing. And I'm not saying it's all bad, by the way. You know, I mean, there were some pretty cool things in our founding documents, you know? I mean, we have a Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights is designed to do what, by the way? Is it meant to give the government power? It's meant to give who power? You. It's actually designed to protect you against the government. It's supposed to limit the government's ability to overreach into your life. And, of course, we had fought a war in the revolution about that, right? Now, this isn't the time for this discussion, but, like, was that really God-pleasing, the Revolutionary War? If you read Romans 13, probably not. The outcomes, that doesn't mean that God didn't bring good out of it, right? But, uh, you know, uh, anyways... Autonomy is just all over our culture. It's been there since our founding in our country, right? But from a Christian standpoint, did God create us to be autonomous beings? No. He created us to be dependent. And who are we dependent on? God. I have heard it said in a pastoral counseling class, and I've seen this countless times, not only with parishioners in the active process of dying, but I've seen it in my father's process of dying, is that what does God, through the Holy Spirit, do in, an, in a dying process? And again, I saw this in my father. It was, it was, 
it's really a contrast because death is horrible, it's evil, but in the same time it can be beautiful, only because God makes it that way, right? Is that God works on us in our, in our lives and especially in our dying, um, if you have time, right? Not, you know, I mean, if, if you crash in a plane, you probably don't have time except, you know, to say anything. But in an active dying process, God is stripping away every this vestige of our autonomous nature, which is sinful, and making and sh- laying bare before us the reality that we are completely and utterly dependent on Him. Because when you're staring death in the face, the only answer is Jesus. You see how that works. And really, our, and that's, that's true of the entire Christian life. I mean, you guys, with one exception, you guys all have uh, years on me, right? I'm not the youngest person in the room. I usually am, by the way, especially my, my job in the aviation. Everybody that I, may, I, I w- led was 15 or 20 years older than me, every time. Um, but the point is this. Um, with uh, this idea of dependence... Uh, God is doing that in our lives, too. He's showing us who's really in control. But our, our sinful nature wants to make it us. So it's this battle that goes on where God's like, nope, it's me. He's teaching us that throughout our lives, isn't he? Earthly versus heavenly focus. I mean, there you use different words there, but you know, you get the point, right? So Obviously, if you're focused on yourself, which they are, right, MTDs, then their, their focus is going to be what they conceive and perceive, which is the world around them. So they have a very earthly focus, whereas Christians have an earthly focus, by the way, and this is a problem in Christianity. We don't want to be so heavenly minded that we're ignorant to the things going on around us. I mean, God created us as human beings in a physical reality, so... I'm not saying the physical reality doesn't shape us and, and is not important to us. It is. Because Jesus uses a physical reality to bring us forgiveness and water and bread and wine, right? But we don't focus on that. So we live in that reality, but we also live in the reality that there's something beyond. Um, when I was watching this professor, Dr. Bierman, I, I just chuckled to myself. You know, he, he, he says in this video, and he, if you watch enough of his videos, you know what I'm talking about. He's like, I don't even use the term heaven anymore. And, you know, this is a theologian, okay? He says, eschatological reality. Um, so what's, that's just a big way of saying eschaton is the end of all things. So it's the last day. So he's saying, don't worry about heaven because heaven is not your home. I've said this, I think, before, right? Heaven is not where you're going to be some disembodied being one day. You are not going to be floating up there with Jesus in space for the rest of your life. On the last day, Jesus comes back. And everybody that is in the grave, even those going to hell, get raised with a perfect body. And then the separation happens. And where do those who are on his right, Jesus is right, Matthew 25, where do they stay? On earth. Meaning that we're, we will be raised out of the grave and the whole creation will be recreated without sin and be the creation that God intended it to be from before the fall. Even better than before the fall, Right? And we'll be here, a physical reality, not some, you know, I got my angel wings kind of thing, right? We talked about that, so that's beating a dead horse. Man-centered versus Christ-centered, right? They all kind of merge together. So last thing I'll say, and I promise to get you out of here, this is the last two. So it's, for, this is where Gene V takes it, the author book, so... He talks about moral therapeutic deism, then he starts to talk about Jesus, right? Because this chapter was Christology. And for Lutherans, who is at the center of everything we do? Jesus. Christology is the study of Jesus, Christ, right? And so when we look at uh, some, some points of what generically evangelical Christians, and again, I'm not doing this to say good or bad things. I'm saying, you know, we, we, for, for reference point, we have kind of got to understand where we stand, right? So we are sacramental. Uh, we use the sacraments, right? And the sacraments point to Jesus. Lord's Supper, baptism. 
it's personal conversion in those kinds of churches, right? You have to make a confession, right? You have to make a pledge to Jesus, right? So baptism isn't about Jesus coming to you. It's about what? Me coming to Jesus and, and calling him into my heart. and All these kinds of things they would say. Well, we mostly, I say mostly, believe in liturgical worship. And, and you can have, again, there can be contemporary elements in there. But when I say liturgical, we don't mess with the forms, you know, the word and the sacraments. Contemporary worship does away with those. Because, again, liturgy is, is focused on the community. This is focused on the individual. Um, or, or it can be, okay? Uh, we have a historical theology, meaning that, you know, what we do as Lutherans is rooted in a book that was finished in 1580, the Lutheran Confessions. But the Lutheran Confessions were not novel. They weren't new. Did you know that? All the Lutheran Confessions are is repeating things that were said centuries before them. Because when, they, you know, when the Reformers saw the corruption in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, their thing was, all right, well, let's go back to when the church was doing what the church should have done. And that was in the first couple centuries. So if you read the Lutheran Confessions, you're going to see lots of quotes from the early church fathers. You're going to see lots of quotes of Scripture. Why? Because they're trying to go back to when it was, before it was corrupted, right? And so we have a historical theology that is not only in the Word, but it's also in the history that shaped us. Versus if you're in a, a more a evangelical church, well, it's up to you to translate and figure it out. What's it mean to you? Have you ever heard that? I mean, I... I this isn't completely bad what I'm saying, but I do cringe sometimes, you know, like people ask the question, well, what does that mean to you, you know, about scripture? <sighs> We're probably going to have the cough for beds to do something like this, so I can't say too much bad about it. But, you know, you can talk about your faith, and that's what we're probably going to have the confirmants do. We've got to have one hazing event in confirmation, so they've got to write a paragraph about what Jesus means to them, okay? But... The point is, you know, if I read a Bible verse and say, well, what do, what's this mean to you? Well, the point, I guess the point I would say is, who cares what it means to you? What is God trying to tell you? It's not about what you're taking away from, but what is it that God's trying to communicate in his word to you? So, you know, there's a difference there, right? Uh, we have a sacramental theology. That just means that God comes to us in ordinary means. When was I saved? I was less than two weeks old, baptized over Memorial Day, uh, 1982. I was born on May 17th, so I wasn't that old. I don't remember it, obviously, clearly. Um, but God came to me and made me alive, where when you get into the more evangelical side, it's more of the making of a decision kind of idea. That's why if you're in an evangelical kind of church, they baptize infants? No. They got to be to it like the age of accountability so that they can make the commitment to God freely. This is how we contrast against the Catholics. How many of you guys have a Catholic background? None of you? One? So what do we, what norms us as Christians, as Lutheran Christians? The scriptures, sola scriptura, right? That's by, by, by scripture alone. That's just the Latin term. In the Catholic Church, there's three pillars that they stand on. One is the power and the primacy of the Pope. I say this jokingly, but you know, I... I you know, the Pope, when he sits on the Pope throne, I mean, he makes decrees. They're uh, ex, -cathed ex cathedra, I believe, in Latin. But, you know, I mean, they basically have the power of, of the tradition and the scriptures. And then the other tradition within the church is tradition. So that's why they search tradition. And then the other pillar that they stand on is scripture. But it's not 100% it's not scripture. Now, they would say to us, well, how sola scriptura worked out for you Protestants? Because how many different denominations are there today? Because everybody kind of splintered based on what they believe from Scripture, right? So, I mean, they have a point if they say that, right? I mean, what are you going to say? Oh, yeah. That's sin is what that is. Um, sacraments. We have three. How many do they have? Do you remember? That's all right if you don't. Mary? Beth? Seven. Marriage is a sacrament. Depending on how good of a marriage you have, that could be a sacrament or a sentence. Right. Um, if I were to become a priest, holy orders is a sacrament because they look at sacraments not the way we do. Some of them are more meritorious, meaning, you know, like um, 
marriage, and I would tell this to, uh, in fact, I would emphasize this and call me a, a downer, but if I haven't done a lot of premarital counseling, maybe this is why. Um, you know, you got to set them straight, right? Marriage is not going to be easy, is it? At times, you're going to want to run from it and hide from it. Um, when you have that first child, your marital satisfaction, and this is scientific studies, will drop by 70%. I know none of you experience that. Right? I'm not asking for an altar call here. But, you know, um, the thing is you've got to be real. You've got to be realistic about things. But, you know, but in, in the point is sacrament. So, so in the Lutheran tradition, these are not sacraments because there isn't a promise of God attached to becoming a priest. There isn't a promise of God attached to uh, getting married. There isn't a promise of God attached to unction, which is final rites if you're a Catholic, right? One of the more odd things I've had to do as a pastor, you know, is I've had, I had a close friend when I was in seminary. He was 20 years older than me, passed away. I was on vicarage. I went up and did his funeral because even though he was Catholic, he hadn't gone to Catholic church in forever. He was a Christian. We had talks. I mean, he believed, but he was a disaffected Christian. And, you know, so while I'm at the funeral, he died suddenly, 56 years old. And I'm talking to his brother, and he's like, can you give him last rites? And I'm like, hmm. I said, I can't. You know, if you want to call the, the Catholic Church down the street, I'm sure they'll come do that as long as, you, you know, you pay your indulgence. I don't know. Indulgence is not the right word. Some Catholic churches, I mean, literally, if you're not up on your giving, you know, there's, you got to pay. I said, I can give them the blessing. I gave them the ironic blessing, the same thing that you guys see at the end of every service, right? And, you know, that, that worked for him because he was a disaffected Catholic too, um, disconnected Catholic um, so anyways, the, that, there's the difference in the sacraments. Uh, authority and uh, authority, questions of authority. Well, we don't have a pope, do we? That's good and bad, you know, because that, that also causes tension within our, our ranks because it becomes a, a uh, popular vote, right, on these things when we end up in convention, and that can be very bad. I've never been to a national convention, and by the grace of God, I hope I never go. I remember in seminary we had a convention. They're on a three-year cycle, so every three years. They fly, I don't know, 15, 20,000, it's a lot, in. They're picking up their hotel rooms. I think their food, uh, you know, I mean, their airfare. And the, the place, like the year that I was in seminary, they had it right down the street in the uh, football stadium in St. Louis where the Rams played. I can't remember the name of the stadium off the top of my head. And I think they were paying something stupid, like $10,000 per hour to rent this facility. And we were watching the live stream one evening, and they went on about something that was just nonsensical debate for over an hour and a half. And somebody went and calculated how much that cost us, you know, for this senseless debate, you know. And, I, you know, and that wasn't factoring in the hotel rooms and, the, you know, the airfares and everything. I mean, just incredible amounts of money, you know. Maybe, pope is good and bad, right? I guess. Um, but we don't have a pope. Um, so our authority is with scripture. Their authority rests in the pope. Not that the pope can go completely rogue because tradition and scripture will keep him from going away. Because again, the pope is one of the three pillars they stand on. The role of Mary and the saints. Do we pray for intercession of the saints as Lutherans? No. Um, we pray, we, we get to, as yes, Lutherans, we understand through Scripture, we have access to the big man, right? We can go straight to the big guy. We generally go through Jesus, right? Because if you want him to respond in a kind way, he will respond better, I say it's jokingly, right? Through his son, right? If you want to get to God's heart, go through his son. And, uh, but, you know, we don't, we don't do that. And that has to do with the, uh, their idea of how they're saved, right? Baptism, we talked about this. Remember, baptism saves you, but then you've got to climb the ladder or the, uh, the staircase of good works. The saints were up here when they walked into heaven. They had the door open and they walked into heaven, right? And these were the, the um, Mother Teresa types. They had done so much good that they were... They, they were on the top stoop a long time before they died, and they just had amassed all of this goodwill and, and good works. So much so 
that when they go to heaven, they still got a bag full of it. So as a Catholic, I know I'm simplifying this, but if I pray to the saints, right, I can pray, hey, Mother Teresa, can you please give me a little bit of your merit? <laughs> That's what that is. We don't do that. We go straight to God, right? Um, justification by faith alone, which ties in with what we've already said. This is the last slide. So it's all about Jesus. This is a quote from Luther. I love this one. So talking about this, you know, because at the end of the chapter, Gene V talked about what? He talked about how for Lutheranism, it's all centered in Christ, isn't it? So the big church word we use is Christocentrality, right? The, the centrality of Christ, Christo, Latin, or uh, yeah, Latin for Jesus. So it's, it's Christ, I mean. So it's the central centrality of Christ. So what's Luther say? The center of Christianity is not the human being, but Christ. That's a complete contrast to our culture today, right? God does not command us to put our trust in any human creature, but only in Christ. It's all about Jesus. I mean, I could have saved you guys an hour and a half if I just started that way. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we're, we're building this out, right, to understand this. But at the end, if, if this is the only thing you get, one of the few things I should say you get out of all these classes, it's that. It's about Jesus. And when you understand that, then you understand the question I've been asking you every week. You know, which direction is the arrow? Well, if, if it's about Jesus, which way is the arrow? It's always coming down to us. Any questions? Yes. Yes. When my father got sick, he was in denial that he was going to die. Yes. Then as he got closer, he kind of shut down. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I will tell you this. You know this all intuitively, right? And if, if you don't, then tell me I'm full of it and, you know, we can talk about it because I could be wrong. But I know in my personal experience, I don't have a nice ascent, right, up to heaven. In other words, I'm not improving to be the moral purity that God's law has called me to be. My, my faith walk life, if you will, looks like this. It's not climbing, by the way, either. It's, 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 it's valleys and it's mountaintop experiences, but it's not going like this. It's, I'm, I, I'm getting drugged through the mud because of my sinful nature all the time, right? After my mountaintop experiences. It's always funny because that's where Satan nails you on the mountaintop. You're in euphoric, you think I've got it figured out, and then bam, he's in there and he's got you every time. Is that your experience? So what happens if you die and you're on a downturn? You're going in the valley with Satan dragging you down. Your sinful nature as well, of course. Are you any less to Jesus when you're up here or down here? Has, do the promises of Christ apply to you any more or less if you're up here versus down here when you die? They don't. Does Jesus know our weaknesses? Yes, he said it today in the sermon, right? He was tested in every way that we were, yet he was without sin, right? And so does, we don't have, in the words of Hebrew, the author of Hebrews, we don't have a high priest that we, uh, who does not um, sympathize with us, right? He knows the problems that we face. He knows the struggles. And again, 
if you look at it from God's perspective, when you're talking about your dad, I think you're worrying about this more than you're worrying about this. And I don't mean that in a bad way, right? Focus on that. Focus on the promises of Christ that came to your dad. Not how he responded or failed to respond or responded dimly, but the promises are there regardless of how he responded to him. And he did respond in faith. He confessed Christ. Regardless of how well he responded to him, it doesn't change the fact that those promises were given him by God. Does that make sense? A lot of people have trouble coming to terms with the fact that they're going to die. My dad had a lot of trouble coming to that. And he didn't have but a... It was in 2016. He went in the hospital East uh, Holy Week. Found out that Monday he was in the hospital in upstate New York. I was in uh, Fort, or, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, living at the time. And during that week he got released. He went there with a uh, A-flutter. It's an uh, irregular heartbeat. And they ended up finding that uh, he was in deep heart failure. Uh, I think his, well, I know we have one nurse here. His ejection fraction was less than 15%. And he was 60 years old. Now, he was an alcoholic. So there's, cardi- there's alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy. And there's other things like the heart, the disease, the blood disease I have, he may very well have had. And if he had that, he didn't know it. And he would have had iron overload by 60 in his heart, which probably would have trash his heart too. So who knows how, how that happened. Two weeks later, he finally tells, tells the doctor he's having pain, which he'd been having for a couple months in his abdomen. They do a x-ray and it's suspicious for cancer right away. And two weeks later, they do, two or three weeks later, they do a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, biopsy. And it's an aggressive form of cancer. And I'm now middle of May, I'm up there with him. I take him to a first cardiology visit. It was two hour cardiology, or not cardiology, uh, um, help me out here, oncology visit. And the oncologist, of course, he didn't have all the records. So he, he left twice for like 15, 20 minutes of time to get records, you know, from the hospital and everything where they'd done this stuff. And every time he came back, the prognosis kept getting worse. It started off, well, you know, if you if chemo and some targeted things, we may be able to get you 18 months. And it's a year. And then by the end, his complete demeanor had changed. And he said at the end of the session, before, right as we're literally walking out, you could tell he wasn't comfortable saying this. He said, you might want to consider going on a comfort drug. And my dad, it went over his head. I knew exactly what he meant. He's talking about hospice, palliative care, right? And so, you know, so it happened and he passed away a couple weeks after that. He had a short, shorter period of time to come to terms with that. And he, he, he said he was okay with it, but he wasn't fully. He didn't come to terms with it. He died on a Sunday morning. He didn't come to terms with it until that Friday night, Friday afternoon. And, uh, but does that matter is the question. And whether or not he came to terms with it or not would not have changed the fact it's still Christ promised to him. And who's on the hook? Remember we talked about the Odyssey. Who is on the hook for ensuring that his promise is going to be fulfilled? Your dad, my dad, or your, your, you said your, your dad, right? Your dad, my dad, no. Jesus is on the hook. It's Jesus' promise, and we know Jesus is faithful. So we always look to Jesus, not the person. You said that you, you got the impression that your dad did kind of come to peace, and then he kind of became unresponsive. It was he, he faced the fact that he was dying. Yes. So we don't know what happened there because facing the fact you're dying also goes hand in hand with facing the fact you're about to meet your maker, right? And I've seen this where people, including my dad, because it was Friday night afternoon, he he was at peace. I mean, I'll tell you this, it's personal, but um, you guys know just the turmoil I think I've said that happened with the family. It was in my aunt's house, just very uncomfortable scenario. He had a junk drawer, right? You have that with all your junk. And he started, he wanted to have an auction. He started auctioning his junk drawer stuff. And we just, we had fun with it, you know? It's like, you know, I don't know if that was the drugs or whatever, but, you know, he, he came to peace with it. He's auctioning off his stuff. And he was serious, though. He said, whatever money, you know, give it to the church. He was auctioning his stuff away. And so we had a little auction. And he went to sleep that night. 
and he woke up two hours later. And I won't bore you with the details, but I think he was engaged in a very real spiritual battle with Satan. So don't make a mistake about it. In those situations, that's where he loves to step his foot into that door because he would love anything more than snatch one of Christ's lambs away at the very end. He was not successful. So that Thursday, that Saturday night, I told you this before, I didn't go over there during the day because of the family scenario. I went in the middle of the night when they were all sleeping, so I didn't have to deal with that. So I was with my dad all that night up until about 2 or 3 a.m. And it was at about 2 in the morning, he told me he was starting to see an angel in the corner of the room. Has anybody experienced that before with somebody dying? It happens more often than you think. You start to see relatives. And uh, we don't know what the dying process is like because I asked my dad as a pastor, not as a son, um, that Friday evening after he, we'd had the auction, I said, hey, um, what are you scared of? What's scaring you right now? And he said, I'm not scared to die. I just don't know what it's going to be like. And so my response was the theodicy thing we talked about. My response wasn't, you know, anything other than, Dad, I don't know. But Jesus knows because he has gone through death. And guess who's going to be beside you the entire way? And so that's what you have to hang your hope on, right? Even for those you're not even sure were confessing the faith at death. My uncle was homosexual. He wasn't actively going to church very sporadically. I don't know what happened to him in his death. But I also don't, don't, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I don't fret over it, I guess is the word. I'm thinking of something else. But I don't, I don't worry so much about it is because it's out of my control. But whose control was it? it? Well, whose control is it in? It's in Jesus' control because when he was baptized as a baby and he was taught the word of God growing up and confirmed as a Lutheran, those promises came from Jesus. And who is it that's going to fulfill those promises? Jesus. And so if God is who he says he is, then I'm going to trust Jesus. Because I'm not putting the onus on his response. The onus is on Jesus and what Jesus promised to do. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Well, I'm sorry again. I've blown out your time schedule. And uh, I really am sorry. I mean, I joke about this. I, wanna, I, I, I do need, I need to get better respect in your time. Um, next time somebody put a stopwatch on. Um, let us pray. Or any last question? All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for, for the time that you've given us together. Uh, we're told that where two or three gather in your name, there you are in their midst. Lord, we thank you for being in our midst today through your spirit strengthening our faith and pointing us to your promises that we can trust in no matter what happens to us this side of eternity. Lord, we know that you are love. We know that you are, that you, you are good all the time, and we know that you are working all things for our good. Uh, bless us this week as we continue to live in this fallen world and be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week.